Hi, I'm Andrew, and this is Keen on Democracy. A chill is enveloping the world. Everywhere I go these days, the conversation is the same. Everyone is fearful about the fate of democracy in our digital age. The same worried question is on all of our lips. What or who is killing democracy? Everybody wants to know. There's certainly no lack of suspects. Trump, Putin's trolls, Mark Zuckerberg, authoritarian populism, the wall, Viktor Urban, fake news, Brexit, Bolsonaro, surveillance capitalism, Erdogan, Twitter, or last but certainly not least, the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. So what's up with democracy these days? Is it really dying? Or is it simply shedding its industrial analog skin and updating itself for our networked digital age? That's the subject of this podcast series. This is a show featuring conversations about the most important issue of our age with some of the world's most incisive thinkers. I hope it both provokes and enlightens. A lot of writers have dipped in and out of technology. They do it for a while and they move on to something else. My friend Clive Thompson has been a tech journalist, quote unquote, for more than 25 years. He began in the mid-90s. He's been observing the digital revolution for more than 25 years now. He's a longtime contributor to the New York Times magazine. He writes for Wired. He's written many best-selling books. He has a new book out called Coders, The Making of a New Tribe and the Remaking of the World. Clive, thanks so much for coming on to Keen on Democracy. I'm glad to be here, my friend. Well, Clive, I gave you a very generous introduction. Justify who you are. (laughs) Well, it's true. I got interested in tech writing when I saw kind of the internet emerging in the mainstream in the mid-90s. Because, you know, I'm a computer nerd from back in the 80s, right? I mean, my book is about coders. And that's partly because I was one of that generation of kids in the 80s, late 80s, that got interested in coding by programming on those things you plugged into your TV, right? In the U.S., it was the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20, and over in the U.K., it was the the Sinclair ZX80, right? So when I saw the internet coming along in the 90s, I was like, oh, I see. All these weird devices that I spent time tinkering with, kind of for fun, are now going to transform life, the way that we communicate, the way that we work, the way that we play, the way that we talk to each other. So that's really what got me into this, and it has never stopped being interesting. So you got it right from the beginning, Clive. You saw in the mid-90s that this quote-unquote internet was going to change everything? Absolutely. I mean, I had a strong sense just looking at, frankly, even email, right? You know, when I looked at that, I was like, okay, this really significantly changes the dynamics of how we communicate globally. And then everything that came along, like text messaging, instant messaging, you know, when I could see the beginnings of social networking and early blogging. I could see that lightning bolt, you know, coming down to earth. So why'd you become a journalist? Why didn't you become an entrepreneur and make some money? (laughs) Well, you know, actually, you could probably blame my mother. We always blame my mother. Yeah, exactly. So in the 1980s, I was, you know, interested in programming computers, the ones you plugged into your TV. And I would scribble legal pads filled with basic code. But I didn't have a computer. I would have to run that code when I was at my friend's house who had a computer or when I was at my high school where you had a couple computers. But my mother did not want a computer in the house because she said, if we buy one, he will just sit there playing video games and flunk out of school. So I decided, okay, I'm not going to get very far with the actual coding stuff. But I love literature. I love reading. And I love books. I love nonfiction books. Towards the end of high school, I thought, you know, it'd be fun to be a writer, basically. And then I went to the University of Toronto, and I just worked in the campus press for four or five years, taught myself how to report, and then I was off to the races. And there's been a lot of books and concern about the crisis of journalism over the last 25 years. But you've survived. How do you make a living? You don't actually work for a single organization. You're a contributing editor. Sometimes when somebody describes themselves as a contributing editor, it sounds like a kind of euphemism for being unemployed. But you're making a living? (laughs) Yes, I am making a living. It wasn't always easy in the early days when no one knew who I was. You know, it was sort of a long haul to sort of establish myself. But, you know, um, what happened, I guess, over time is I just sort of kept at it. You know, in a lot of fields, if you just refuse to go away, 
eventually all the people that run the show are like, all right, he's not leaving. Let's use him. And the reason why I've sort of never, I guess, worked with any one publication is there's a lot of different audiences I want to speak to. Each of these magazines I write for has a different, unique audience. And it's kind of fun trying to think of, you know, how to take the things I'm passionate about, technology and society and the cultural impact of tech, and get it out to readers of the New York Times Magazine, which are a little different from the nerdier readers of Wired, which is different from the sort of more progressive readers of, say, Mother Jones, you know, or the folks at Smithsonian who are really interested in history, right? But I got to say, it's been very lucky, and it's been a lot of fun. You ask, though, how is journalism going to fare? And that's a great open question. I mean, I think it's something that if you want to talk about democracy, as your podcast does, it's a central, central issue. And it feels like we are in media's res right now. We're still in the middle of something that is swimming into view. And I can't tell you that I have an answer of how it's going to shake down. I think that the area I work in, print magazines, are a very interesting sort of test case because on the one hand, they are very susceptible, as all media is, to disintermediation, to these large platforms like Facebook and Twitter becoming the brokers between their audience and them. And I think, as we've seen, that can be quite disastrous for the business models of a lot of media. But on the other hand, magazines are weird because they're not as fungible as newspapers and TV shows. People still often want to hold the thing. It's a luxury item. It's not something you do every day, you know, read a magazine. It's a little treat you do for yourself when you're on a flight or whatnot. And so they have a little bit more of a physical hedge. But I couldn't tell you if that's going to be enough to keep the whole industry propped up. Certainly, there are a lot of wonderful magazines have died in the last 10 years. Well, speaking of fungibility, there's nothing more fungible than a book. And you have a new book out, as I said, Coders, The Making of a New Tribe and the Remaking of the World. What is so special, historically, Clive, about coders? Who are they? What are they? Where did they come from? And where are they going? Very simple questions. I mean, coders, pretty much since the discipline began back in the late 50s, up until now, they're a little different now than they were back then, but they share some very similar traits, as I found by talking to people in their 80s, right, who, um, who got into this in 1960, and people who are like 14 or 15 right now and are getting into it now. And you can see certain common traits, right? Some of them are the ones you'd expect. They are good at thinking logically and systematically, and they are incredibly, incredibly precise, sometimes maddeningly precise, right, you know, to their, <laughs> to their loved ones. As a lot of them have said, they can be kind of hard to be friends or having a relationship with because they're just, can be kind of pointy-headed. Precision really matters. They're also a sort of a class of people that are um, interestingly obsessed with, I find, efficiency and optimization, right? And you see this from the very early stages of coding up until now. It's a very common thread, which is that computer engineering is a form of engineering. And engineers historically have always been obsessed with, like, making things run faster. You know, how can we take something that's a repetitive human activity and speed it up, automate it? And that goes right back to the steam engine and even before. But computers are kind of a weird test case because they can automate a lot more things. A computer, when you're coding it, is a machine that becomes other machines, depending on what instructions you give it. And so you can automate thinking tasks. You can automate physical tasks. You can automate financial tasks. You can automate cultural tasks. And what happens is that every coder I talk to becomes very, very almost um, aesthetically swept away by the pleasure of speeding things up and optimizing them. And it's very much almost like a instinct. If they see something that's being done inefficiently, they want to get in there with some code and speed it up. That, I think, has become one of the really interesting effects on society, right? You know, to have this class of people that are very, very deeply committed to optimization. So how has this remade the world? You've described this new tribe, and you claim in the book that they are remaking the world. Are they remaking the world in their own image of sort of anal precision? Are they making the world into a pointy-headed reflection of themselves? <laughs> the short answer is sort of they are, yeah. I think that what we've seen, if you take a look at all the major pieces of software that have you know, really woven their way into everyday life, what you see over and over again is that it's exactly this instinct to you know, get in there and optimize things and take things that are kind of fuzzy and make them a little more sharp edged and make quick decisions. You know, often that has been greatly to society's benefit. I mean, I'm old enough. Let's just take the word processor, right? Omnipresent piece of software. 
world-changing piece of software. I'm old enough, you're old enough, to remember typing, typing documents out, having to write on a typewriter. I'm old enough, I even remember a world before typing. I'm sure you do, yeah. When we wrote by hand. Yeah, wrote by hand. And, you know, remember carbon paper, you know, to get multiple copies of a document? <laughs> you know? So it's funny. This is That's what the CC in an email is, right? Carbon copy. This crazy old um, oh, reference. Yeah, I'd never thought of that. Yeah. I'm old enough, you're old enough to remember that it was quite laborious to write back then. And the laboriousness could sometimes be useful because it would sort of force you to slow down and think a little bit. And I think you lose some of that when you get a word processor. But by and large, I would say that there's been great benefits to the electrification and digitization of composition. And the quantification, is that really what you're suggesting that coders are quantifiers, yeah, yeah. right? It, that that's their language of, of ones and zeros. The language of speed and quantification, right? So you get word processors and suddenly we can write and we get this torrent you know, of writing. We can change, we can think on the page. And, you know, I would argue, you know, okay, that's actually been a more or less good one. But now let's think about something that's more complicated, right? Let's think about, say, um, civic utterances, like talking to each other out loud in public. And, you know, that was done a lot more slowly in the past. Again, you know, letters to the editor, stuff like that, going to a public forum and talking to politicians, talking to each other, very slow. Something like Facebook, Twitter, social media comes along. And the desire is to, again, optimize and speed that up. Like, we want a lot more people talking. We want a lot more people talking to each other out in public. And there's some great things that have come out of that, for sure. I rely on social media all the time to get ideas and stories. But what we've definitely seen is that it can also create these, and you've sort of nailed this in your writing, these sort of tsunamis of information that can flood people, that can brown them out, that can tune them out because there's so much to deal with that they stop really processing information in a good way. And it also becomes kind of a game, you know. Can you be the troll that sort of games the Facebook algorithm and pushes their crazy conspiracy theory high up by artificially upvoting it? Isn't there also a sort of a paradox here, Clive? I think you're, of course, right about coders reshaping the world. But there's also been a dramatic reaction against that because coders, as you suggest, are rational, they're pointy-headed. But as we experience this dramatic digital revolution, which is as profound, as disruptive as the industrial revolution of the 19th century, it seems as if there's also a reaction. Sure. Sure, the coders are rational, although at least they're rational when they're coding. I don't know what they're doing when they're not coding. <laughs> but it seems everyone around us is going crazy. We have the rise of populism. We have the rejection of democracy. We have the rise of charismatic authoritarian leaders. We have the rise of xenophobia, more and more hatred online of women and minorities, less and less of an ability to actually speak in a, a reasonable, civil way to one another. So is there a connection between what seems to be the infestation, if that's the right word, of populism today and the remaking of the world by code and coders? I think there is partially, absolutely. The lion's share of what's happening with the populism today lies in um, the long-term neglect of the economic state of the West uh, by its rulers and long-standing, you know, racist and misogynist views that have been unfortunately with us for millennia, right? But there's definitely a part of what coders have done with society that plays a part in this. It comes back again to that acceleration of expression that we see, and also the sort of, I guess, monopolization of civic expression into a few silos, right? Facebook, people talk about it being a monopoly because it was so successful in getting people to say, hey, let's talk more, let's talk more. And they made a lot of money off it with ads. But it kind of turned into, you know, what coders themselves would call a single point of failure, right? A place where so much civic activity was happening in a corporate area, that it became kind of hazardous because it became an easy place to intervene if you wanted to be the populist agitator or the racist agitator or the misogynist agitator who wanted to get in there and mess with the public. That was a lot harder to have an impact 20 years ago because no one had made a nice single honeypot for public expression. That is what the coders that made Facebook did. And they intended to do that, right? I mean, that is exactly what Mark Zuckerberg's stated goal was in the beginning was to create a point that everyone would have to come to to find out what was going on with their friends and with the world. And that has been a very, very dramatic direct effect. Now, here's the thing, though. You talked about reactions. 
this is kind of where the ball is moving and this is really interesting to me because you've accurately pointed out and as you've documented on the show, there are a lot of people outside of the world of code that are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what has happened here? How have these small number of tech firms, big tech firms, gained such outsized power in determining the civic realm and turned it into a profit-making enterprise where they'll just happily post crazy conspiracy theories, you know, because it makes them ad clicks and money. So you're getting that pushback, which I think is good. But you're also, and this is really interesting, and I document this in my book, you're getting pushback from inside the world of coders too. Because there's a generation of software developers now, younger ones, and even some older ones, who are frankly kind of appalled and concerned with what they've done and what their employers are doing. So you get, you know, the older ones, the sort of 40s and 50s, quote unquote, you know, graybeards, who really did not, they were naive, they did not foresee what social media was going to do. And they are now really concerned about it. They're not always the ones making the decisions, right? You know, the sort of Mark Zuckerbergs and Jack Dorsey's. I'm not necessarily talking about them. But what's really interesting are the young ones in their 20s. They grew up, they got interested in coding. They got that, you know, fun optimizer, binary ability to wield logic. They love that stuff. But they grew up seeing social media and big tech companies make deals with the devil and sort of follow capitalism down its kind of rat hole of ad click optimization. And they are really not into this. And so you've actually seen these uprisings of coders and designers, actual employees for Google and Microsoft in the last year. They've staged labor walkouts saying, hey, at Google, we don't want you making AI to help the military kill people. Over at Microsoft, you've had huge petitions from coders saying, we don't want to write code that optimizes the ability of ICE to grab and deport migrants that are coming up from Latin America. This to me is really interesting because this is a very interesting evolution in the sort of ethics of coding and potentially the rise of a, of a generation or at least part of the generation that pushes back at this. As you know, there's a huge debate now, both in and out of the United States about how to regulate or control or manage or perhaps even break up the big tech monopolies. Are you suggesting that if we just stand back, these companies will be reformed by their young coders? Or do the young coders themselves need help? Or will they all leave the big companies and go and form their own tech companies, which do a better job stimulating a civic culture? No, I don't think the companies can reform entirely on their own. And I don't think even the best in new generation of coders and designers with deep ethical concerns can force that type of change either, even with their best efforts. There is really only one force on the planet that can change the trajectory of very, very large corporations, and that's essentially government regulation. That's the will of the people expressed through government regulation. Now you're sounding like a Canadian. <laughs> I, know, I really am. This is where you can completely tell my Canadian view of how the marketplace and the government ought to interact together, right? But the marketplace in the US certainly has never been free. All of these tech companies are able to do what they have achieved because they were latticed on and helped by incredible amounts of government investment in the core technologies that made their stuff possible. Like, you know, so the US government spent a ton of money, military money really, bankrolling the development of the microchip. There was no market for that back in the 50s and the 60s and whatnot. It all came about because the government was like, we need microchips to do stuff with the military. If they hadn't been the buyer of first resort for a decade, you would not have computers today. And even things like deep learning, Facebook, Google, these companies are being transformed by machine learning and AI. Where did that come from? That actually came from the Canadian government, which spent like 15 years patiently investing in the work of people like Jeffrey Hinton, the University of Toronto, back when everyone in the free marketplace was convinced that deep learning would never work and would not put a penny into it, right? And Hinton works for Google now. He works for Google now, exactly. Every single one of these innovations that you see came from government investment. So like all these companies, you know, they need the public sphere. And one of the things I think they need them for right now is to help reform them so that they are actually not going to be victims of I suppose, even worse public reactions over time, you know? That's what a well-functioning marketplace does. It thrives under appropriate regulation. I don't think we have appropriate regulation right now. Although I will confess, I don't know exactly what appropriate regulation would look like. 
So let's say we have, again, quote, quoting you, appropriate regulation that can fix the future in some way or form. How can your new class or this new tribe of coders, how can they remake the world a second time around? Yeah, yeah. And particularly democracy to fix so many of the things that seem to be so profoundly broken. I think a couple things I hear from young developers and designers when I talk to them when they reflect on the problems they see around them. One of them is that I think they now sort of, or some of them certainly, understand that the first instinct should maybe not always be to get in there and optimize everything. Or at least if you're going to make some sort of new tool or new piece of software that you think will solve a problem, that will optimize something to solve a problem, that it's incumbent upon you, given the powers you wield, to think about what the side effects of that might be and sort of war game it a bit. You know, you take a look at something like Uber, and it's a classic codery optimization ploy. The people who designed it looked at the world and said, well, there's a huge inefficiency here. People waiting for cabs don't know where the cabs are. People driving the cabs don't know where the customers are. So let's optimize that. Let's create an application that connects the two up algorithmically very quickly. And, you know, that turned out to be a fantastic benefit for me, the writer, but it had a side effect of really corroding the ability of drivers to make a livelihood doing it because suddenly, you know, they were no longer in control of the rates they could charge or they had to drive certain amounts of time or frankly, there was just tons of more cars on the road because it became so easy to become a driver. And this has been ruinous for an entire generation of immigrants who used to use this as a pathway to, you know, a middle-class life in North America. So classic example of like, a really interesting and in many ways very useful optimization, but there should have been some thought up front about that. This is what I hear when I talk to some of the younger coders today who are looking at this stuff. You know, they're thinking, yeah, I kind of want to do this, but what might be some of the side effects? How can I think about designing my new app, my new piece of software, my new intervention into the marketplace to sort of maximize the gains? You know, I want to make a business out of this, but also respect the fabric of the civic realm around it. And that's not a new thing. Like, you know, intelligent capitalists have always done that. So let's talk specifically then about democracy. And you've talked about the coders creating a more efficient world of ones and zeros, the kind of utilitarian dream that has existed for 200, 250 years ever since Jeremy Bentham. Yeah. You're suggesting that the result of that hasn't always worked out. Are there models for a more sort of efficient political system that also generates more civic responsibility and engagement? Or is there a problem that the rational world you're describing is fine for thinking about consumers, but not citizens? Mm -hmm. Because consumers think in ones and zeros, consumers think about, okay, I want to get a better deal on Amazon, or I want faster links on Google. But citizenship and politics it can't be codified. Right. It can't be quantified in the same way as consumerism can. Is that fair? Absolutely. I mean, what we've seen that has been so ruinous about the algorithms that places like YouTube and Facebook use to try and figure out, you know, hey, what should society be looking at right now? What are we going to recommend? They're working on these fundamentally fairly reductive models of what's valuable, right? It always comes down to something propelled by their ad needs, which is, you know, let's take something that people are frantically clicking on, which is wines is generally going to be something that's emotionally engaging. It makes you angry. It makes you laugh really hard. It makes you pissed off. And let's shove that higher to, to expose it to more people. And this is a fundamentally reductive way of thinking about how humans work. And you're talking about the need to respect more the whole person. So are there any models you know, for software that does work that way? I would argue, actually, yes, there are. A lot of them are just a lot smaller scale, so we don't really notice them. What I'm really actually thinking of in a way, let's just talk about social media. When people talk about social media, they think about the very big ones, Facebooks or Twitter, it's the things they can see, YouTube. But when I actually go around the country and the world interviewing people and saying, hey, you know, so what do you do online? You know, where do you hang out? Where do you find the most existential value, you know, the most emotional or aesthetic or spiritual value. They'll say, well, you know, I, I use Instagram and I use things like that. But their eyes will light up when they tell me about some weird, tiny, you know, specific forum where they go to talk about their weird hobby, right? So maybe they're like a snowboarder. And there's like four different of these snowboard BBS discussion boards, you know, one that's hosted in Switzerland, one that's in Santiago, one that's in Ottawa. 
And there's really only maybe a couple hundred regulars, but they all hang out and they spend all their time talking about snowboarding. They end up talking about all sorts of other things that are of civic import. They wind up talking about global warming, right? Because that impacts on it. They wind up talking about their lives. And they build up some really interesting common connections with far-flung people that are far more valuable and respect the whole person than what you see in these highly transactional, atomized interactions that have been designed by Facebook or Twitter or whatnot. But Clive, that's all very well, and I accept that. But wouldn't it also be fair to say that some of the people you're describing also go on these obscure networks, whether they're Reddit or 4chan or 8chan, and talk about gassing the Jews or killing all women? Entirely possible, but you asked me about what sort of software interventions are possible. And what I'm pointing out here, one thing that tends to make people talk to each other more on a human scale level is actual human scale size communities. There is something, one of the problems we've had with all these large social networks is that they have been in a rage for scale to grow, to grow, to grow, to make lots of money for the venture capitalists, to make lots of money on the ad market. And I think the one principle I've seen from talking to people that have made communities at work is that they're all smaller scale, right? And frankly, often they aren't even working on the free market at all because most of these places are like tiny. They don't need to make any damn money because they don't cost any money. They're working off free code that was put together by, you know, various open source coders just for the hell of it. What I'm talking about here is the design principle of software, right? Now, how you actually turn that into something that can become a model for business building at the Silicon Valley level, I don't know. I actually think that in a weird way, what it shows is that the best stuff happens outside of the marketplace entirely. So I don't know how to reconcile those two. But I can tell you that that design principle of smallness tends to produce much, much better human scale outcomes. I want to be cheered by you, Clive. Um, <laughs> you're the most cheerful guy I know, the, probably the last cheerful guy in tech. <laughs> but when you say this stuff only works outside the market, it kind of depresses me because the reality is that that's not going to work. I would at least argue we've learned over the last yeah. 25 years, I've been around the tech business the same time as you, is that non-market solutions simply don't work. You know, Tim Berners-Lee had a wonderful vision. Yeah, exactly. We all respect him massively, but it failed. It was replaced by the market. So how do we figure this stuff up with market solutions? Yeah, things that make money have a high level of sustainability. You know, this is something I talked about a lot with people in my politics chapter because I was asking them, so, you know, what are the principles of reform that you think would lead to an improved social sphere online? And your politics chapter is entitled Scale, Trolls, and Big Tech, right? That's right, yeah. Because scale is often one of the big problems, right? Something that Anil Dash pointed out, he's been around tech for a long time. He was involved in some of the earliest social software and blogging, and he currently is the CEO of Glitch, which is a company that's trying to help inspire a more sort of a more diverse in every way group of people to sort of become coders and become people who can intervene. So what Anil said is he goes, you know, the way that you can have market-based solutions that go out there and change the world but don't fly off the rails as you create ones that don't need that can make lots of money without the need for that massive scale and some of that has to do with like developing business models that simply don't start off this we're going to give everything away for free and then make money off ads right you know and that comes down to venture capital models right like you know what are the venture capitalists looking for so he spends a lot of time talking to entrepreneurs and talking to venture capitalists and saying look you are going to go after some easy money with this kind of scale quickly and get ads. But you're not necessarily going to produce a sustainable business in the very long run. You're certainly going to produce one that is in any way healthy for the world around it. And if you actually care at all about that, and a lot of these people frankly do, you know, it's kind of funny that I'm a left-wing Canadian. I'm actually one of the most pro-capitalist left-wing Canadians I know because I have an enormous respect for the kind of wonderful excitement and energy that comes out of trying to build a company. It often brings the best out of people. Like they work really hard. They solve problems in amazing ways. They challenge themselves to do things they could never do. But as Anil points out, with the venture capital backing model right now requires this insane growth. It's that scale problem that's in the title of my chapter that a lot of the problems begin. So he's encouraging a lot of entrepreneurs. He says, don't take venture capital money early on. They will wind up yanking your chain and saying, you need to grow like a hockey stick, like a hockey stick. And that is where you will begin making terrible decisions for the long-term health of your company and for the health of society. And the longer you can go making something awesome, figuring out how to make money without necessarily using ads, freemium models, all sorts of different things are out there on the table, you can produce social software that's fantastic that doesn't fall into the traps that Facebook or YouTube or Twitter have fallen into. 
So finally, Clive, I'm going to get you to put on your rose-tinted spectacles. Not that you need to. I think you wear them all the time. They're contact lenses, man. They're in there all the time. Okay. Your rose-tinted contact lenses. Let's imagine that the world you fantasize about in your chapter on politics, let's say it, it comes about. Let's say some of these problems are got rid of the problems of the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Googles of the world. In 25 years, when you know as well as I do in tech, when we say 25 years, it means 25 centuries. Mm, we really that's have right. no idea. Yeah, we have no idea. But in 25 years, what will the world look like? This world of coders, how can they remake the world and particularly democracy to make it better? Be utopian, very briefly. Dream for me. Give me four or five minutes of dreaming. One thing that I think I would really be hopeful about and I think would change things a lot is if there were a slightly higher level of literacy in the average person about what it means to write code and to produce software, because that greatly demystifies it. Even knowing a little bit about it makes it harder to believe some of the BS that Silicon Valley people come at you with, you know? When they tell you something's impossible to do, you know it's not impossible to do. When they tell you this is the only way to do it, you know that's not the only way to do it. And so I would love a world 25 years from now where people have a basic literacy in how software works that's similar to their basic literacy in the way that cooking food works, right, you know? With the same level of understanding that you almost have now about nutrition, where we went through this like 30 year period of like fast food that like caused an obesity epidemic because it seemed very convenient. And now on a society wide, we've been looking at it from the cultural level, people saying, hey, let's try and eat better on an individual level, let's move more. And on the political level saying, let's mandate, you know, lower sodium levels in food. I would love a world where that type of attitude exists with code, right? Higher level of literacy among citizens, higher level of literacy amongst the political classes, such that you can actually have a software world that isn't a big mystery, where people aren't regarded as these sort of, you know, wizards that are producing stuff, where it's frankly a lot more humdrum, where people can create their own things a little more easily. And people have made more tools like what Anil's making with Glitch that allow people to make their own tools so they don't have to necessarily always rely on the stuff that's been made by the large companies. You know, you could think of Facebook as becoming like McDonald's. Eh, fun thing to frequent, but you don't want to be there every single day, right? And you don't need to because you can cook the damn meal yourself when you want to. That, to me, would be a fantastic world if we could achieve it. So more technological democracy will trigger more political democracy. Yes, we won't be so reliant on a few tech giants to do everything for us. That would be a world I would love to work towards. And how realistic, Clive? Very small. <laughs> very, very small. I mean, like, like it, it, it requires a lot of things to move at once that are currently immobile, right? You know, the educational system, the political classes, these are very, very hard things to do. I would love to see that happen. I will do everything I can to try and make it happen. But at the moment, it's a remote possibility, I will say. I think really what we need is technology that will turn everybody into Clive Thompson and then the world <laughs> will be a better place. Can you work on that one, Clive? Or can Anil fund a company to do that? Uh, oh my goodness. A world run by Clive Thompson's we need a whole other episode to deal with that, Andrew. Good. Well, you'll come back on the show and we'll do that one in the you future. Got it. Clive Thompson, as always, uh, a pleasure and an honor and best of luck with an excellent new book, Coders, The Making of a New Tribe and the Remaking of the World. The book is out right now. You're listening to Keen on Democracy with your host, Andrew Keen. Hello, I'm Jason Sanderson, the producer of the show. Now we're about to take a quick break while we hear from our sponsors. But please stick around as Andrew will be right back to conclude this episode with his five takeaways. Hi, my name is Steffi Czerny and I'm the founder of the DLD Conferences. DLD is short for Digital Life Design and explores how the digital age fundamentally changes our world. Founded in Munich in 2005, DLD is now a globally connected community of thinkers, doers, and communicators. We host conferences in Munich, New York, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and Brussels. And we are very proud of our interdisciplinary outlook and even more so of our track record of discovering trend topics early on. Andrew Keane is a long-time, long-term DLD friend who has done many interviews at DLD conferences. If you like this podcast, you should join one of our events. Our motto for this year is optimism and courage. 
we want to put a really positive spin on recent technological developments from AI through blockchain to quantum computing and discuss which impact they have on business as well as politics and society. Visit our website at dld.co and apply for your ticket. Thanks so much for sticking around. Now here's Andrew with his five takeaways from this interview. So what to make of Clive Thompson's ideas about coders, his new tribe, who Clive at least claims are remaking the world? On one level, of course, I think he's completely right. The ideology, if that's the right word, of his new class, the coders, is one of extreme efficiency of ones and zeros. And they are indeed in many ways remaking the world in their own image. It's a world of extreme rationality, a kind of an unregulated form of capitalism, the market logic of capitalism. The consequences of this revolution, as we know from this series and as you all know from everything around you, is one of extreme wealth for a tiny group of coders, coders of Silicon Valley, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, and increasingly inequality for the rest of us. Ironically, as Clive talks about, and I think this is a really important observation that Clive makes, the other side of the coin of the coding revolution of this new tribe that's remaking the world is the rise of irrationality, the rise of xenophobia, authoritarian nationalism, rejection of democracy, the cult of Erdogan and Putin and Trump. Ironically, as Clive suggested, this is, in a weird kind of way, connected with the increasing rationalization of the world. So what to do about this? As Clive says, and this has been a theme throughout our series, there's only really one fundamental way of dealing with the problems that have been caused by the coding revolution, by this new tribe that has remade the world. To quote Clive, he says, there's one force on the planet, and that is the government, that's the state. He makes, I think, a good argument for this, particularly in the way in which he explains that the coding revolution itself is built on the foundations of government and state investment in technology, that companies like Google wouldn't exist if they hadn't got initially grants from the government and hadn't been able to build their technologies on resources and ideas and technologies that are originally funded by the state. So the old libertarian argument that the state needs to keep out of this because the Silicon Valley Revolution was driven always by free enterprise, as Clive suggested, is wrong. Where I think Clive offers a very original and interesting take on our current problems, the problems of the crisis of democracy, of inequality, perhaps the looming crisis of unemployment generated by AI, is his reliance on young coders. He says there's an uprising of young coders, that the kids now who are working for Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple, they don't like the old world. They want to reject the values or at least the outcomes of the current world of big tech. He says that they are willing to reject the cult of scale, reject the idea of getting funded by venture capitalists so that they can grow to become billion-dollar companies. This is Clive's hope. This is his optimism. This is where he believes that the future might be better than the past, that the first generation of coders, they weren't bad, but they were naive. They didn't get it. They didn't understand the unintended consequences of the digital revolution. This next generation, the people now working in Silicon Valley, the people coming out of university, with the same kind of idealism that drove the first wave of coders, these people have learnt from experience they're not going to make the same mistakes. So how optimistic is Clive? His optimism, of course, is built, I think, as he even acknowledges himself, on wishful thinking. The reality, and this is the depressing part of what Clive is saying, The reality is that his vision of a future of coders who are building technologies which are more humane depends on a kind of rejection of the market, depends on a rejection of capitalism. And the reality is that this isn't probably going to happen. 
So my conclusion from what Clive is saying is that realistically, if we want to make the world a better place, we need more regulation. Now, this isn't just because Clive is a Canadian or that I'm an Englishman. The real truth of the matter, as Clive said, is there's only one force on the planet to right the wrongs of the digital revolution. There's only one force on the planet who can bring out the best aspects of the digital revolution while confronting some of the more problematic areas, which today, of course, we know all too well. So in conclusion, I think it's important to note that where Clive perhaps is over-optimistic and unrealistic, his focus on regulation is important. And it's one that's come up time and time again in this series and will come up again and again in the future. Now, we've got a real big favour that we need to ask. If you like this episode and you've been enjoying the other interviews, we'd sure love it if you head over to the iTunes podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to hear more episodes, there's a subscribe button there and in all of the platforms like Spotify, Overcast and Google Play. So head over to one of those, subscribe, leave us a review, share it with your friends if you'd like, and we'd appreciate it so much. Be sure to check out our next episode every Thursday, and from all of us at Keenan Democracy, we hope you have a fantastic day.